Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Today on How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, we have Abigail Wald, who is a parenting expert and the founder of Mother Flipping Awesome, and she's also a mom. And we have the Missy Pyle, famous actress starring in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Dodgeball. And I'm sorry, my favorite along came Polly. I have to throw it in there. <sighs> And these yeah. lovely ladies are the hosts of the parenting podcast, Raising and Rising. And I was on their podcast not too long ago, and I walked away a different person. I, As anyone listens to the show knows, I have a spicy little daughter who's fabulous, and I wouldn't change a thing except for how she likes to fight with me every day and all day. But I employed some of the strategies I learned on their show, and I am not saying this. Nobody's paying me to say this. It's a world of difference around here. It's, and she's a kind of on to me. She's like, what did you do? I'm like, nothing. Just keeping yeah. my Petri dish clean. If you yeah. studied your science, you'd know what that meant. And that's where we are. Amazing. So today's subject in my podcast generally is not as light, um, but it does have a lot to do with parenting and what we can do not to raise a serial killer, but also what we can do to help children who won't necessarily become serial killers, but are not heading down the right path or who are suffering trauma. So I'm going to tell you about a story, brace yourselves, it's unpleasant, um, that happened in December of 2004 in Skidmore, Missouri. There's a lovely 23-year-old woman named Bobby Jo Stinnett, and she'd advertised her puppies for sale. Bobby Jo and her husband, Zeb, were dog breeders, and they were super active in the rat terrier community. So they had they were on, online, and they would go to the dog shows. It's a rather small community, so you know each other generally. And she received a message from a woman named Darlene, with whom she had been familiar because of an online forum called Ratter Chatter. Darlene wrote that she was interested in purchasing one of these puppies. So Bobby, Joe, and she get to talking and they realize they have a ton in common. They're both obsessed with the rat terriers and they're both expecting babies in the next few weeks. So they bond over sharing stories about pregnancies and dogs, and then they make plans to meet the next day on December 16th. Darlene is wearing pregnancy maternity clothes, and her husband thinks she's pregnant. What Bobby Joe didn't know, though, was the woman who reached out to her was not Darlene. It's a woman named Lisa Montgomery. Lisa had physically met Bobby Joe years ago at a dog show and had followed her on these social media handles, what do we call it, platforms. And um, Bobby Joe had announced her pregnancy on one of those dog forums. Now, Lisa's on her second marriage. She was first married to her stepbrother, which is part of another story we'll get into later. She had four children with him, because this is normal, and mm -hmm. um, is in, embroiled in a nasty custody battle. It's around this time that she claims that she's now pregnant with her new husband, and her first husband says, there's no way, she's lying, and I'm going to use this lie in, lie in court to fortify my custody case. He says she cannot be pregnant because Lisa had undergone tubal ligation procedure 10 years prior. And it's impossible to become pregnant spontaneously if you've had a tubal ligation, unless it's some like vast miracle of God and things are, you know, burrowing through. But generally speaking, it doesn't happen. But since that procedure, she had claimed to be pregnant over four times. Um, miscarrying, at one point, she was given $40 from her husband to get an abortion. It's unclear what happened there. But a lot of pregnancy claims. So when Lisa arrives at Bobby Joe's house, it's around 1230. And Bobby Joe left Lisa on the porch when she went to go retrieve these rat terrier puppies. So Lisa's playing with the puppies and ostensibly deciding which of them she wants to buy. Mm. Bobby Joe turns back to put the puppies back in the house and Lisa attacks her, mm. begins strangling her with a cord that she'd brought with her. When Bobby Joe loses consciousness from the strangling, mm -hmm. Lisa pulls out the kitchen knife that she also mm -hmm. brought for the attack okay. and begins cutting into Bobby Joe's abdomen. Uh -huh. This 
causes Bobby Joe to gain consciousness again, oh. as, it, as it would. She begins fighting for her life, and Lisa simply tightens the cord more and kills mm. her. But then she frantically uses the skills that she gained by, get this, watching videos on C-sections. Yeah, how to get a baby out dot com. Jesus. And cuts the baby from Bobby Joe's womb. You can jump in if you have any questions there, because... Um, Does the baby make it? The baby's perfect. The baby makes it? She did it perfectly? She's like a murdering doctor. So Lisa Montgomery, who's like acting like a doctor, sufficiently and sophisticatedly clamps with the umbilical cord that she'd bought online to bring with her. She then leaves the house, puts the baby in the car seat she's installed because she knew she was planning to kill a woman and steal the baby. And um, she drives away. Well, shortly thereafter, Bobby Joe's mom starts to get worried because Bobby Joe was supposed to pick her up from work at 2.30 and she works super close. So she ended up just walking to her mom, or to her daughter's house to be like, what's up? Why, why didn't she pick me up? Then there's the 911 recording of her mom calling to, to report. It's harrowing. Like, it's not fun to hear. It's She's pleading with her daughter. She's talking about the blood. She says it looks like her stomach exploded. And she's like, it's, just, it's not, she doesn't realize she's dead. So she's pleading with her. So Lisa, elated, meanwhile, is do 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 just driving to back toward Kansas. She ends up at the woman's clinic in Topeka where she calls her husband and she's like, oh, I did it. I delivered her. We have a baby girl. And he goes to the parking lot and fetches them and to drive them home. And, and they're just elated to show everybody this baby girl they just had who they named Abigail. Really? I'm sorry. (laughs) I almost left it out, Abigail. P.S. Her husband had no idea what was happening. This guy's not in on it. Also, how are you not knowing your wife's not pregnant? And I feel like that's an episode in and of itself. That feels important. I don't know. Maybe she hit it well and they weren't intimate. Okay, so Bobby Joe's very distraught mother tells investigators about Darlene, who was meant to come by that day. And with ease, they're able to track down this Lisa Montgomery because, of course, she has an IP address and from her chats with Bobby Joe. Simple, simple. So the police arrive at Lisa Montgomery's house the next day where she's holding the new baby on her lap. Oh my God. They begin to ask her questions. They're like, hey, you and that baby, why don't you come out here? And so she asks to speak separately from her husband because she doesn't want him to know what she's about to say. And what she tells them is that she um, did deliver this baby yesterday, but she did it at home because they didn't have enough money for the clinic. But she doesn't want her husband to know that because he'd be upset. So then the investigators say, well, okay, but fine, where's your placenta? And she said, well, I disposed of it at the creek, just right down the street, presumably so that they wouldn't go looking for it. So as investigators begin pressing her again, I'm sure she comes to that realization. They probably threaten her with it. I'm making that all up. But all of her stories begin to fall apart, and she admits to killing Bobby Joe Stinnett and removing and kidnapping the baby. (sighs) The baby was promptly returned to the father and was named Victoria Joe Stinnett. She's no longer Abigail. Sorry, Abigail. So now let's talk quickly about the trial before we get into kind of what was going on with this woman. The killing was obviously meticulously planned out. There was no way anybody was going to be able to say it was impulsive. They got in a fight and she's like, I'm going to kill you. Oh, also take your baby. It was cold blooded. But naturally, the the defense is planning to use insanity pleas. and, And there will be a lot of mental health arguments that are made during the trial. There was the possibility that she suffered from pseudosiasis. It's a false belief that one is pregnant. But the prosecution could easily poke holes in this argument because Lisa behaved as if she knew she weren't pregnant. She didn't seek prenatal care like she did with her other four children. She bought items that she would need in order to remove and kidnap Bobby Joe's baby. So that argument kind of fell apart. Then there was an argument that she was schizophrenic and had a delusion that she was pregnant. But there's an important distinction. If you have this hysterical pregnancy, once it's proven to you that you're not pregnant, you no longer believe you're pregnant. Hmm. With a a schizophrenic who believes they're pregnant, they'll never give up that belief that they're pregnant. So she's not fitting into any of these stories. And schizophrenics who are having this false delusion that they're pregnant, their stories are consistent all along. But Lisa told various stories about the sex of her baby, when it's due, whether it was twins or singleton, she was all over the road. Now, I should make it clear that Lisa Stinnett is in no way normal. She does have a lot of mental illnesses, but none that should have led to this. 
So it took only five hours of deliberation, which is not long. And Lisa Montgomery is found guilty and sentenced to death. She was sent to death row in a federal prison that houses women with special medical and psychological needs. So we're all agreeing that she's not, it's not like one of us went and did this. So as time goes by, Lisa secures a new defense team. And that's not uncommon. It happens when you're going through the appellate process and there's 9,000 appeals. And they attempted to get her death sentence commuted to life in prison based on facts that were never shared during her trial about her horrific upbringing. Mm -hmm. They argued that had those facts been called into evidence during the first trial, she would never have received the death penalty. They said there was mental illness on both sides of her family and that her mental health had deteriorated as she became desperate for a pregnancy and became more delusional. So I saw an interview with Lisa's half-sister. She talks about a horrible rape when she was eight and how she protected Lisa from that. But then she gets pulled from the house shortly thereafter, not because of the rape, but because of parental neglect. And now Lisa's stuck in this house with her mom and her stepdad. The abuse that her half-sister saw early on was extreme from the beginning. Her mom would duct tape Lisa's mouth shut just so she didn't have to listen to her. When she was like a little girl? Little girl, like four. They, they would tape, three even, tape her mouth shut. So, but by the time she was 11, it could have happened earlier, she was being raped by her stepdad. But it gets weirder. Her mother was trafficking her out to pay debt. So they're always working on this trailer they have. Plumbers and electricians would come in. She would tell Lisa that she had to earn her keep, and this was her duty. And then the dad built a little room off the trailer where his friends would come and rape Lisa. There's a lot of pushback, ladies, about these stories because they did not come up until 12 years after the trial, and it's Lisa herself who's proposing them. So a lot of people are like, well, can we believe this? But in her defense, her half-sister saw some of it. Her cousin corroborated most of it. And get this, I, I work, I'm a litigation consultant as my side hustle, and I've never seen this happen. The chief expert for the prosecution testified that he did believe she was gang ra- raped and trafficked. So in prison, Lisa has been diagnosed with a long list of mental disorders that make her delusional. Um, There is evidence that sexual abuse can lead to increase of likelihood of future arrests and criminal behavior, but murder is not usually on the menu. I think she got here by means of mental illness stemming from her abuse, but this is this is something I think is good to talk about because an untreated victim of this level of sexual violence, what do we normally see? Well, we always see PTSD, right? We always right. see that. But what's the slippery slope here? Is it Well, the thing that I think you're also going to see for sure is dissociation. It's very hard to take care of other people if you've been shut down. So so you know, even on a very simple level, right? Um I'm often explaining to parents that you cannot give which you yourself don't have, right? So if you yourself haven't experienced being cared for, it's not that you can't care for your children because you can, you can make a decision. I'm going to give my children a different life for sure. But you have to have some experience of what that means. So somewhere in your life, it doesn't have to come from your parents, You have to experience care in your body so you can pass it forward, right? Like you literally can't pass forward something you've never experienced on any level. Can that include what you've seen on television? Because I I witnessed a lot of that when I was a kid. I would watch families that were nuclear, that would talk through things. And I began to like understand that and talk to my parents my stepfather in particular, like, hey, can't you just talk to me about why are you yelling at me and threatening to hit me when I've witnessed other people talk about it? So I'm just curious. And, you know, you say that I just get like chills in my body. Absolutely. And you can get it from uh, friendship. You can get it from later relationships in life. You can get it from watching television, movies, The closer it is to you, the more you have the personal experience of it, right? Then obviously the more healing 
It is. Because you can watch that on television and go, huh, that's possible and it's possible for me. Or you could watch it on television and think, fuck you, that's not what I get, right? So it also depends on how you're going to sort of metabolize that input, right? So you could contrast it. They have that, I don't have that. And and work work away from that. That's interesting. I always look at everything like a math equation. It's like, well, if I'm X and the TV is Y... We don't know what Z is on the other end of that equals because is it a plus? Is it a minus? Is it a, you know, multiplication? Is it a division? It's like there are variables in there and those variables are are exactly what we're talking about. Like why does one person grow up with sexual abuse and, you know, they become a therapist. Another person grows up with sexual abuse and, you know, they can never, ever recover from the PTSD. Another person grows up, they become a neurosurgeon helping people. Think about if you have been silenced, literally gagged, if you have been forced to dissociate from your own body, if you have been forced to see your body as a conveyance, a payment, well, here's what she does. She silences the woman, gagging her, binding her throat, and then she uses her body as a conveyance. I mean, this Ah. is what she was taught. I had not thought of that. It's a different presentation, it's, it's, but... It's symbolic. Symbolically, it's very similar. We can sit here and go, yes, this is what she's thinking, but obviously she's not thinking. I mean, just like saying, well, I had this baby, but I had it here, or I threw the placenta in the creek. Like These are obvious lies that are so easily disproven. Mm-hmm. She's clearly not in reality on some level. Like I think this is what we see in PTSD. There's this constant compartmentalization where A, you're overtaken by the emotion, you create your own magical reality to deal with the situation, and you can't actually process what it's going to be in regular real life. Like I think she's in such a fantasy world at this point. And I'm not saying that she shouldn't be held accountable. It's just, you know, and and listen, I think this is a really difficult question for everybody. Like, at what point do you hold people accountable? Like, is she accountable? Are her parents accountable? Are the people who raped that child in the trailer accountable? Like, how far back do you go? We as a civil, you know, as we as a a group accountable for allowing this kind of thing to happen in a, on a regular basis, the number of children that are raped by family members that we that we haven't figured out a way to help these people. You guys are nailing the next point really well. She was walking around saying she was pregnant when that was an impossibility, and yet nobody offered her help. So who all knew that, though? Her mother, like her, the people, her sister, her, well, her, her new husband should know it. People... I don't think she had much of a relationship with her mother at that point, but people knew about this tubal ligation and no one, and that's not the only place people didn't help her. It's, it's a story that weaves throughout her life. It does not justify the horrific crime she did, but society failed her. I mean, only once through her disgusting childhood did a social worker pay the family a visit and they called ahead of time. So the Montgomery's, her parents were like, okay, let's, tape her up and make sure she doesn't talk. And then there was a doctor in Oklahoma who examined her when she was a child and he learned about the regular rapes and he did nothing. He didn't report it. Oh my God. The child welfare office who Montgomery's mother, Judy herself, informed that there was sexual, informed them there's sexual abuse happening in my house, didn't do a thing. And then a family court judge who was presiding over the family's divorce, the parents' divorce, um, actually scolded Judy for failing to re- the, to report that rape that she had reported before to the police, but then he did nothing himself. So there were a lot of places where this person could have been helped. Wow. And 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 wasn't. And to add insult to injury, I I dug up her brain scan. Check this out. She has not only structural differences and functional abnormalities, but the neuroradiologist reading the scan said it's likely from physical abuse, poor neonatal environment, neurodevelopment brain disorder exacerbated by PTSD. Well, we know that there have been studies on this that, you know, the way a child is treated from zero to three alters the brain structure. Mm -hmm. We know this. And if you look at scans of children who are in abusive environments versus scans of children who are going to get, you know, neural attachment, uh, the brain looks completely different. So 
we can infer from a parent who by the age of three and four is taping their mouth shut that there was probably not a lot of back and forth relational attachment. And all that neuronal growth that happens, I mean, even just touching a child is super important right? Um, for that brain development. Yeah. What so happened in Eastern to Europe. say what her brain would have looked like? And again, the neonatal care in this instance was probably not fantastic. Um, and, you know, but, but, but who's to say what it would have looked like, you know, if somebody had adopted this baby on day mm-hmm. one? Mm-hmm. Right? No, that's a good point. I, I think that brain structure would have been fundamentally very different. So in orphanages, they were finding in Eastern Europe, they were just overwhelmed with uh, with babies who had no parents. And these, these orphanages would keep the babies in their cribs and they'd go in and feed them and change them, but they weren't interacting with them physically. And they all ended up... Um, I don't even know how to describe it. There was such brain injury from it, just neural development delay. They they appeared to be so, um, they couldn't walk, they couldn't sit up, they couldn't speak, they had no language. They processed everything very slowly. It was like all of them had been born with a neurodevelopmental disorder, but they had not. They just didn't recognize the importance of parental touch in brain development, parental talk and parental touch. And the lack of trauma. That's also an important detail. So it's kind of like that. If she's being neglected, not taken care of, not touched, you know, not allowed to speak, you could imagine her her brain structures would look different. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's a really fascinating conversation because the reality is that raising a child is an extremely complex thing that requires a tremendous amount of support and knowledge. And yet somehow the idea that we have certain requirements that must be met, taught, passed on about how to raise children, which is our most important job for our species, Amen. we're completely uninterested in. We don't legally see it, emotionally see it, governmentally see it, personally see it. We should be acting like a village. There are programs out there, we talked about them on another podcast, that reduce, like they go into these low socioeconomic areas where there's not a lot of support for new moms. Once a month, a nurse comes in, you got to feed yourself, you got to feed the babies that are here. When the baby's born, you've got to touch them this way. You have to do all of these things. You've got to stop smoking and drinking. And the baby's weight needs to, to increase. And they came every month before the baby is born and for two years after. And in these subgroups, there's no criminal behavior. Everyone else keeps the same baseline of criminal behavior, but almost eradicated criminal behavior for the people who receive it. And these are high-risk people. But you know what? Only 4% of the people in the United States who need that service get it because of funding. But you know what? We're funding the hell out of the prisons. We wouldn't need as many of them if we did more of these preventative programs. It's devastating. And we are all paying the price for this. Can I ask a question too about, um, because what I think about is Lisa's mother and her story. And I mean, there's no way, I mean, there's very little chance that she would do those kinds of things if they hadn't been done to her. Missy, you're hitting this problem that I've had since study, starting to study this 20 years ago. How do you disentangle it? This yeah. person is inheriting the genes that make you aggressive, violent, alcoholic, and, and 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 living in the environment. And you better believe the person above them had the same situation. And that's where it becomes so difficult to disentangle. You know, where does it begin? Because I'm sure she was abused too. And I'm sure she had susceptibilities somebody passed put down a, from her mom. I guarantee you somebody put tape on her mouth or the dad's mouth. Somebody, that, somebody did that. So why do some people rise from yes. trauma and become altruistic citizens. Why do some become Lisa Montgomery? And researchers have been looking at that for years. And I think there's two things that we can talk about that are at play. At play. One are protective factors. The things that you are just naturally born with or given that you don't even recognize that almost fire or wall you from the worst effects of abuse and trauma. Some of them we know about. High IQ is a protective factor. Of course, nobody can control their IQ, but that's a protective factor. Even having a close, um, loving relationship outside the home. You guys talked about this. Missy, you mentioned this. Seeing it on TV can be a protective factor. 
finding a good friend and being able to go to that house, that's a protective factor. And then just regular temperament. Some people, there's no matter how much you can abuse them, they aren't going to be violent. They're just, they just aren't, they just don't have it in them. And if everybody was going to be violent post-trauma, then every war-torn country would raise a generation of criminals. So there's the protective factors. I can't see, and Lisa was not, she did not have a high IQ. I don't think she had any protective factors. But then there's the other thing, jumping in and getting treatment, right? And and there are some treatments for this level of trauma, but who's going to be giving them to her? Who's going to... Where does it where does it stop? Like the teachers, the pediatricians, obviously her parents aren't going to be doing it, but how do we stop this generational train that has left the station decades ago and and stop this person from this type of an act? First of all, I mean, you've got to also look at like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So part of the problem is that, for those of us who don't know what that is, do you mind just so telling yeah, me? basically that you need shelter. You need food. You need all your basic needs to be met before you can begin worrying about the state of your soul or your mental health, right? So, you know, if I, as Lisa's parents, and again, I mean, it's it's just unconscionable to even think about, but think like, well, I've got this, you know, trailer full of kids and I don't know how to feed them, but hey, here's one way to get money. I mean, how do you make that leap? Like, how do you go, well, I will, you know, prostitute out my child um, and that's how I'll get money for the trailer and get the plumbing fixed. Like, that's not your first thought. You know, you have, you got to be so confused by that point for that sentence to make sense in your brain. Or it, it happened to you, you know, that's what your mom did or your dad. I don't know. Listen, I do think there's also this, I don't know, a normalization, right, that happens from your own experience from, like, you go to the doctor and you tell the doctor and the doctor writes it down and is like, yeah, you probably shouldn't be doing that. Okay. Uh, how's she eating? Right. Then you go, well, okay, I guess it's okay. So oh nobody's giving her a checks and balances. Nobody's coming in. The social worker's calling and then coming and saying, looks Okay nobody's giving the boundary. And that's one of the things that I'm always talking about with parents is like, you have got to be a boundary. Like there is a value as a society, as a parent to have a boundary. Like there is a value to going, hey, that's wrong. Yes, there's neural attachment and connection and accepting people as they are. Absolutely. And then there's a place where we have to go, hey, that's not cool, right? And if we don't have that at some point, it's a problem. Well, and, and you hit on another point I started digging into, which is why aren't people, why aren't these people stepping in and saying, hey, mom, you need a boundary. Hey, mom, you've got to do something. All this research I uncovered is really depressing. It's talking about how regular providers like your pediatricians, they don't want to ask because they don't know what to do next. And they mandated yeah. reporters don't sometimes want to get involved and it's, it talks a bit about how there's a cogent argument for routine trauma screenings across mental health and primary care practice settings, as this offers the opportunity for children and families to access professionals with knowledge, skills, expertise, resources to provide assistance. So let's say that Lisa's mom has like a moment of clarity and is like, okay, where do I turn? I'm abused. I don't know what to do. I, I see my, because the, oh, this is key. The first time her husband raped Lisa, her mom was mad. It was like, and was mad at Lisa. How could you do this to me? So there might have been a moment she was open to help. And she was mad at Lisa, though. Yeah, mad at Lisa. Yeah. But, you know, who knows if she's, and it doesn't have to be the mom. It could be a teacher. It could be the half sister. Or the dad. I mean, the dad. the, The reality is the dad knows he's sick, right? And the mom is the one who actually even did make some attempt right? In this case, and wasn't given any support for it. No, no support. Um, But I think, you know, there is fear of like, oh, well, only so much can be done. And what am I going to do? I don't have support for these people. And then if I say something, you know, who knows if there's going to be domestic violence and then what are the support and what happens to the other children? But it's craziness. I mean, we can't just turn a blind eye, but 
but I, I, I mean, I wish I had an answer. I don't. I don't know. You know. Well, I've been, I've been. This has been driving me crazy trying to cobble together. There are resources in in these lower income areas, um, but there are there. It, no one knows about them, and you have to get into the study, and you have to apply for it, or somebody has to nominate you. And I'm sorry if you're worrying about paying your plumber with your daughter. You're not. You're not pursuing. And you're not thinking normally anyways, as both of you have said, if this is even crossing your brain to prostitute and and even said sex traffic your child, then you're not looking for help. But this, this, these studies are arguing it's got to be the teachers, it's got to be the pediatricians who have to ask a question. It can be a very simple question that isn't feeding an abuse story to the kids. The, the most suggested uh, question was, since the last time I saw you, has anything really scary or upsetting happened to you or your family? That one question can help identify the children as a part of just a general screening. And then like that teacher or that pediatrician can then set a performance and routine assessments and, and pass them off to somebody who can help them because typically it's being avoided by teachers because mandated reporters often avoid this because it embroils them in a complicated mess. You're also asking these people that, you know, we pay very little money to, to become, I mean, that to add to their plate of education, you know, making sure that the, uh, Men- mental, emotional, and physical development of the child is also being taken care of and, put- and putting that on their shoulders, which is, I would think, a very hard thing to ask That's one so person true. who has, I don't know, how many students do some of these teachers have? I mean, I guess th- there is a small silver lining if Lisa or anybody who has experienced severe sexual abuse does have the opportunity to get help. There is a lot coming from trauma-based CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, if you can get in there. And it's, it, 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 briefly, it's 10 to 20 therapy sessions, and it includes education about the sexual trauma, um, strategies to promote relaxation, deep breathing, positive coping skills, techniques to address the inaccurate or unhelpful feelings surrounding it, like the guilt, the shame, the remorse. And then when you're a little bit more comfortable, slowly reintroducing details of the trauma as a way to extinguish the trauma-related emotional behavioral responses. It works over time. The younger the child is, the better. Even Lisa as an adult could have had some of this. Um, And when it's with a kid, they usually have a parent. If there is a willing caregiver, a grandparent, an uncle, anybody willing to do this with the child, that translates to changes being made in the home, support of this person. Because they don't, I mean, the children almost never report. They almost never report. So just teaching them how what a safe space looks like and really giving some of these skills to the other non-abusive parents in the home. It's not perfect. And a lot of these children and adults, because of the severity of the PTSD, also need to be medicated for a period of time to reduce the anxiety. Aren't we still getting this too late? Like, I feel like we're like having our own fantastical, magical realism of somehow a teacher is going to be able to step up and say mm-hmm. something and then we'll be able to get this family support when there's so much other shit pulling these people down that mm-hmm. is systemic, that is economic. There has to be a place in which, again, zero to three or from the moment of pregnancy, there is a communal care. Maybe we can create something like that, but it seems to me absolutely unrealistic and magical thinking to think like somehow we could, we just report it. It's like, it's like trying to solve the problem of, you know, shooting in schools by like just placing an officer at the, at the entrance. Like, no, this problem is so much fucking bigger than that. And if we could have funding for those magical, like th- what you're saying makes so much sense. And I'm sure there are countries I don't know off the top of my head. I, I would imagine it was Norway, where it's like th- they recognize that their future economy, their future criminal system, all of that depends on what you're talking about right now. And that early investment would really reduce the expenditures. Because look, you know, you know, we're talking money. You know, we're talking money. Oh, yeah. And that would 
there's proof that that would reduce future expenditures, especially in the judicial system. We're all clogged up there, but we have all this research, like you're saying, that if we intervene and we support the parents early on, then we don't have to deal, and also omega-3s, everyone, everyone take your omega-3s, we don't have to deal with these problems necessarily to the degree we do now. And trying to clean up a sloppy mess who can get better but is never going to be whole. She's never going to be whole, no matter what you do to her. No, and I think I think what ha- ends up happening, I mean, I think sort of what happens to us all and what's happening to us a lot right now is that we're sort of paralyzed by all of the negative information and the idea of being able to actually do, you know, fix it all is so overwhelming that we don't remember that a journey begins with a step. So it's like one of the rules in acting when you're improvising is you don't ever say no to someone who gives a line like, uh, do you want to go to the mall? No. It's like, yes. Are you a astronaut? Yes. And it's yes. And so it's like, yes. And another idea might be this. And I, I think the idea of being able to say to someone, you're like, even in gun violence, like all these, there's, you know, it's like, well, this is the solution. And this is the only, this is, I get in this argument all the time where it's like, this is the most important issue. It's like, okay, that's for you. That's the most important issue. For this person, it's this. And we can all go out and work on those little things. Like, you know, once you stop listening to this amazing podcast and these three incredible women, what will spark you and make you go, okay, I want to look up because now we have, I mean, Lisa probably, and her parents probably didn't have Google search at that point to figure out how to do all this stuff. But we do, we have everything in our fingertips. Tips You can look up ways that you can help and then that you can take one tiny step forward. I'm beginning to realize like how important that is. And, and it isn't just the government. It's also corporations with shit tons of money. Everybody has money to give that they have to give. And where can we find ways in our communities to go? Listen, I just want to say, like I had everything going for me. I had a great education. I was later in my life having children. I was married to somebody I wanted to be married to. I wanted children and having my first son like wrecked me. I think part of it was the PTSD from all the medical stuff that we had to go through because he had a very significant medical condition. Um, but, but you know, the postpartum and the PTSD and the fact that children are unbelievably difficult, like for some people. Okay. And if you have a history of trauma, it can Mm. be deeply traumatic to become a parent. And so we don't talk about this. We don't acknowledge it. We just think you're just supposed to be okay. I was not okay. You know, the reality is I was able to get the help that I needed. And because I was able to do that, I had this very strong feeling of like, holy shit, I just got out of a burning building. I'm going back and getting every fucking person I can. So I really want you guys to listen to what Missy is saying because you don't have to have a degree. You have to care. You have to understand. Mm -hmm. You have to heal yourself. And then you have to know how to heal other people. We can do this as a community. We can step up, just do what needs to be done and show up for people. And it takes time. And we have to remember we live in a world where you can get anything you want in 15 minutes. You can get a toy delivered for a birthday party from Target in an hour. It's amazing. And we think that's what I think we're conditioned to think that things happen fast. And, you know, how long did it take the cigarette industry? Like, I mean, they, the anti-smoking and it took years and years and years of PSAs. And and this grassroots that you're both talking about, I think, first of all, thank you for sharing that story. Like, the, I agree with you. People don't talk about the trauma of, of, of having a baby, how triggering it can be, not just postpartum, the whole taking care of a baby's triggering, especially if you have post-trauma, and that is if your baby's healthy. If you have a baby who's at risk, big needs, you're spending time in NICU, you don't know prognosis, that is, that's trauma. That's trauma. So thank you for sharing that and, and helping everybody else because, I mean, it's not talked about. I think it took Brooke Shields to even talk about postpartum depression. But this grassroots movement thing you guys are talking about, I think it's really timely, especially right now. When the school shooting happened, I you know, I got on air, talked to a few people. I have this theory that any change we gonna get we're gonna get from gun or in gun control needs to come from the NRA itself. Any any 
a hyper focus on mental health is going to have to come in through that. And like you're talking about, what is what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do in your house? Who are you willing to talk to to discuss changing the age when you can buy a weapon? What are you willing? Okay, you say the problem is mental health. You're convinced that's the only reason we have school shootings. Neat. What do you suggest you do in your community to help with that? It's if we grassroot this and don't, it's just people just talking rhetoric. Oh, it's guns. Oh, it's mental health. We need to figure it out and we all need to participate in this because it's just going to happen again and again and again. And I'm loving this idea of taking a big issue. This is what this this trauma related murder is a big issue. And what can we do on the ground? It's so easy to say, well, we'll let laws, legislation, people with degrees figure it out. It's not enough because nothing's changing. I don't think anyone wants to hear from the experts right now. They want to hear from people who are pissed. You know, in terms of Lisa, the question remains, what community is going to pick Lisa up? You know, I thought about this a lot as a kid who experienced um, very different kinds of trauma um, as a child. You know, I always wondered, like, I remember walking around thinking, like, do they know? Mm. I remember that thought. Like, doesn't mm, anybody do they know, know what's happening to me? Oh, but but then there's this part of you that's like, well, my job is to hide it because you get that communication very clearly. And again, to be clear, I wasn't dealing with anything like what Lisa has dealt with. But I think like we do know we just we don't we don't know what to do about it. We don't know how to help. You know. Then we also forget how powerful we are. Like, you know, when you do one thing and you you take a step for something and and you're, you know, it's that whole boldness has power and magic in it. And I think the idea is like, oh, you have to create something huge. But really, it's just, you just have to do one thing that I was reading this Marianne Williamson book a while back and was talking about like people who are always saying like, oh, people, you know, talking about people who are hungry and the, you know, it's just, it breaks my heart. It's like, well, find one organization and give them Mm -hmm. 25 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. Do it. Do and something. then you've done something. That's what whatever it is you can do, a little something. And then you don't have to feel that way. Yeah. And then if you start feeling that way, what can I, what's one thing I can do? If we all do that and we build on it and we build on it and we build on it, I think that the depressing part of us all just kind of being paralyzed by all of the negativity makes us just go, well, fuck, I'm going to just go drink a bottle of wine. But think even more so, you know, you feel that way. And you're still going off and shooting movies, right? You know, and and the reality is like now look at at somebody who like, what are they looking forward to? They're literally sex trafficking their child to get the fucking plumber to fix the trailer with a doctor and a school that's not stepping in to help. So like that learned helplessness is so huge and it is passed down from generation to generation. And you know, when we talk about, you know, economic inequality and, and racial prejudice, like that's all in there too, right? Mm-hmm. It is just this constant oppression. And and you're right. Like, how do we dismantle these huge things? I don't know, but doing nothing is not an option. I agree. You cannot do nothing. And we can all sit there and say, well, I can't make a difference. W- would you fucking try? I, and myself included. I do a lot of talking. 100%. I feel the same way. Part of it is recognizing very, very deep mental illness and what brought that person to to do something like that. But sitting around and and I've never approached my my podcast like this. I'm always like, okay, guys, the research is this. We got to do this. You got to put your kid in this. But maybe it's not your child that you need to deal or who you need to deal with the trauma of sexual abuse. But somebody's child does need you to do something. And anything we can do, any vol, like just getting in touch with these organizations, look up these programs. The only one I know of in the United States is this, this nurse study. The researcher was Oldman was his name. He started in the sixties. It has had the most incredible fricking track record because not, it doesn't just treat the kid. It treats the mom. These moms went on to go back to school. They stopped doing drugs. They stopped um, drinking alcohol and they're like the subsequent children that they had all did as well as the one who was treated. I just want to say, I am continually humbled by the change that we are able to make just by coming together. Like it is not impossible. 
people's lives fundamentally change trajectory. Like what is possible for somebody going out is completely different than what was possible for them coming in. It is possible to do this work. Would you tell the listeners about your program? Yeah. I I mean, I work specifically with parents who have, um, you know, strong will kids or highly sensitive kids or kids who are neurodivergent or 2E, twice exceptional, or um, just kids that are more challenging or parents who have had trauma, right? So parents who come, parents who are highly sensitive, parents who are strong will, parents who have a background of trauma, people who are looking to stop intergenerational trauma. So anywhere along that spectrum, sometimes the kids are just ex- exceptionally gifted. So they're more challenging. It's not, it's not um, any one specific, it's just Anybody who finds themselves unable to build the parenting story they want to have, right? They have a dream, but their reality is falling short of that dream and, uh, you know, needs to tell a new story. And that's essentially what we do. And then we create the stepping stone and the scaffolding that allows you to actually do that. And that means sometimes going back and healing trauma, but but it's not in it's not a therapeutic model. It's a very specific action-based model and it works. I had a similar story to you, Abigail, and that, you know, I felt like I was so excited. It took me a long time. I I had several miscarriages before I um, finally adopted my daughter from birth. And I was so excited. I was single, you know, I did it by myself. I thought it was going to be, you know, I was so excited to be a mom. And, uh, and then it became, she was very challenging. She was very strong-willed in a way that, I, and I, I was very sensitive, and I had no, I would find myself being like screamed and yelled at, and I just would be, like, I was I completely, I had no idea what to do. I went to the, I went to the file cabinet to, for what to do, and, and and I had trauma in my childhood too, so it's like there was nothing there. The, the the file cabinet was empty. So, and then I was introduced to Abigail after a few other failed attempts at other things, and I love a lot of these online people, but they. You, you have to have a certain kind of kid for that to work. And some some kids are not like that. And and it, it was so much more play-based. And I realized like so much of me changing my approach to it, to her, and like their brains are so different. So it's just like mm-hmm. coming down to where they are and learning to communicate and get in their world with them. But you, you have to emotionally rewire the parent before mm-hmm. the parent can even begin to play with their child. So- The first thing is that the parent has to be held. The parent must be cared for. The parent must be repatterned. The parent brain must be healed. And then once the parent brain is healed, then you skill the parent and you teach them the language of children and you teach them what children need that creates a brain that can make the positive choices. And you put all that together and you've got a fucking functioning family. Hmm. And then you got put a bunch of functioning families together. We've got a functioning society. Ah. Uh, right? That's poignant. Yeah, it's certainly one piece of of it's of what we need to do. I also did a little research just now online and I found a a ton of, you know, people who are trying to advocate for the same thing. One of them is zero to three.org, you know, early connections to find resources and services. I, I, you know, I don't know much about it, but I do know that there, that was a quick search. So I didn't know to look for it though, when I was pregnant, you know, I didn't know to, to, I read a book called brain rules for babies, which was a research-based book. And that's all I knew. Like, I didn't know that there's these resources for everybody. Well, you also don't know that you're going to need them. (laughs) Until you have a kid, you no. just don't even know. I no. didn't even. I didn't even have any postpartum. I didn't. I went jogging the day my daughter was born, you know, because she didn't come out of my uterus, and I still was like completely taken down to my knees, and by by not really knowing what to do. Want and want. I think you have to want to as well. And like, I used to work for a suicide hotline. I was like a counselor. Oh wow! And well, it, listen, listen. It was a while, ago, and and I we would have people that would continually call in, but they were help rejecting and it was very hard. So there's those people I think that are, that people, you know, like someone like this person, um, Lisa might've been, where it's just like, you want to help them, but they make it so fucking hard. Mm -hmm. You're just Mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I really, I don't know how to help you. And the younger that you get in, the easier that is right? So you can imagine if somebody had tried to help three-year-old Lisa, 
that would have been a lot better than trying to help seven-year-old Lisa, which would have been a lot better than trying to help 17-year-old Lisa. And by the time she's 23, we're in trouble. That brain is fully formed and it's been formed in very misshapen ways. What ended up happening to Lisa? So all of Lisa's appeals were denied. And Lisa Montgomery, the only woman on federal death row, died by lethal injection on Wednesday, January 3rd, 2021, after the Supreme Court vacated several lower court rulings, clearing the way for her to become the first female prisoner to be put to death by the U.S. government since 1953. I have a question. There's another baby that we're not talking about here, which is Victoria. How's Victoria doing? I didn't get a lot of info on her, but my sense from what I got was she's good. She's fine. She's, um, I think, you know, she's with her dad. And this was in 2004. So, you know, she's she's grown up and um, probably wants to be anonymous, I imagine. I'm glad Victoria is doing okay. And yeah, it's just really a tale of like, just a family that wasn't acting like a family that wound up ruining many families. Just Lisa falling through the so many cracks yeah. and then ultimately being put to the, you know, like. Well, and many people argue that she should not be put to death because they so. say the people on death row are not the most dangerous. They are the most vulnerable. The vast majority of them, the vast majority of them have suffered incredible trauma, have brain injuries. They're not necessarily the most vicious who get there. They're often the most broken. And yeah. it's, I, I was reading articles about it and, you know, there were a lot of people saying she's so, she's so mentally ill now that she didn't even really understand that she was about to be executed. And that's, you know, that's a different theoretical ideological podcast for someone, you know, it's somewhere else some other time. Well, ladies, thank you so much. I think you. this was the perfect podcast for you guys, like I, perfect case. And um, this has been How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. And we'll see you next week. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N. T-R-A-S-K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at hownottoraiseaserialkiller at gmail.com or call and leave a voicemail at 818-392-4403. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. Thank mm-hmm. you.